Hi, everyone. My name is Dennis Gway, and I'm your professor for LHR 533. Um, today, I'm going to record class one and class two. Um, it, it'll be one longer recording, so you can break it up based on your schedule and your needs. Um, let's kind of get started um, just by way of introduction. Um, my name, again, is Dennis Gway. I'll be your professor for this class. I am also the president and chief customer officer of Allegiant Global Partners. Um, and Allegiant Global Partners is an organization, a consulting um, firm that focuses on advocating for nonprofit organizations and creating employee benefit packages for the nonprofit sector. Um, my background, I was the global head of Unrang at Aetna International, a regional director of Unrang at the Hartford. An executive vice president. I'm also a college professor and a published author. Um, the learning outcomes and objectives for this semester are quite simple. One is to build a working knowledge of the most common employee benefits. You'll see that throughout this course, we're going to talk about real world um, business challenges when it comes to employee benefits. We're going to gather marketplace intelligence. Part of our one of our projects is going to be exploring the marketplace and determining um, what some decision-making factors will be if you were in this in a role where you had to make decisions for employee benefits. And then upon successful completion of this course, each participant will be able to identify core aspects of an employee benefits package. Hopefully some of you already have an idea of what that might look like based on your work experience to develop working knowledge of the benefit industry, meaning which carriers exist out there which insurance carriers offer what benefits, um, how to evaluate those carriers, things like that. And then third, we're going to develop or refine a benefits philosophy for your organization. So you're going to think through, like, why do organizations offer benefits? And if you were a decision maker, how would you be thinking through that from a philosophical perspective for your organization? The class assignments are basically our four graded components, and I'm gonna walk you through each one of these right now. I'm actually gonna turn my camera off so it's less distracting. Um, one is class assignments and participation is worth 20%. So this means when we do meet live, which we don't meet, meet live that often, I'm expecting active discussion um, on assignments, whether it's in your small groups or in the group lecture uh, sessions, teamwork on any simulation work that we do. Each member of the team will have an opportunity to provide feedback on one another. And it is expected that each student comments and participates in virtual and in-person platforms throughout this semester. The written assignments are periodic um, reading summaries as assigned. So um, this means that when we do talk about different assignments either in the class or there's a discussion posed over email that people are chiming in and sharing in um, feedback and thoughts. Number two, worth 20% is a group marketplace study. So the class will be broken into groups and prepare a presentation on the top insurance vendors in several key benefit areas, including medical care, dental, vision, life, and dis disability. The presentation should be no longer than 15 minutes. It should cover the following. It'll cover the products sold by that insurance carrier, the customer feedback, and the value proposition differentiators. How does that company see itself as different than its competitors in the marketplace? So that's worth 20%, and we'll go over that in greater detail um, throughout the course. Number three is the group simulation, which is worth 20%. And this is one of my most favorite parts of the class where we're going to be broken into three to four groups that will form a fictitious company. Your group will work through a series of projects to help shape and form your benefit strategy and then prepare a presentation that should be no longer than 30 minutes. Your presentation will include the overview of the challenges as they've been presented to you, the potential considerations that your group comes up with, financial results, recommendations, and an employee communication suggestion. Then the final piece is a final exam, which is worth 40%, and it is a multiple choice exam that covers all of the reading and class lectures. So I will note that all of the reading materials could potentially show up 
in that final exam. Most of those, mater those materials we will be reviewing in class lectures, either live or in pre-recorded, but not all. So it's really important that you are doing number one. You're reading your class assignments, you're reading assignments, and you're submitting your two-page summary. Let's go to the next piece of the class overview of the syllabus. Um, so you'll see I sent out several communications. Um, this schedule is a little bit um, odd compared to other semesters that we have. We will actually have 10 classes in total, but only three of those will be in person. Um, so it's really important to mark this on your calendar. It will be July 11th will be in person on the Kingston campus. July 18th will be in person on the Kingston campus. And then July 25th will be in person on the, on the Kingston campus. So today we'll be covering class one and class two of the syllabus in front of us. So you also notice that you have a written assignment, which is a two page summary of your reading due by June 30th, okay? Um, and you can read through each of those assignments. You'll see there are due dates. It outlines the readings that are that are um, scheduled for that class. You can submit your written assignment via email, and I'll share that email when I release this um, video to you. And you'll also notice here your group marketplace project will be introduced and overviewed in class five. And then we actually will immediately have our group marketplace presentations live on campus for July 18th for class six. And then our group simulation assignments will be due in class eight with live presentations. And then the final exam will be virtual. It will be a multiple choice exam, which will be class nine. We'll review the final exam together in person on the July 25th class as well. Seems like a lot because it is a lot. We have a lot to cover in nine short classes and we have July 4th in the middle here, which creates some complexities with our scheduling, but we will get through it all. Um, and if you have any challenges or hesitations, please definitely reach out to me. In terms of the materials you need, um, you definitely need the Handbook of Employee Benefits, seventh edition. If you um, do not have this, I recommend getting it. Um, you can find it on Amazon um, and you, you can have it shipped to you um, urgently. I believe there might be a digital version as well, but I'm not sure. It'll be very hard for you to do the course and the written assignments without the book, obviously. And I do recommend the seventh edition because that is the preferred edition. Um, and that's where all the paid assignments are tagged to, so it's going to be easier. The second book, um, which is optional, you do not need to uh, use it, is my book, which is a user guide, um, Employee Benefit Terms, a user guide by Dennis Gway. And you'll see it pictured here. You can buy this on Amazon as well. It's a great resource um, book for you if you are in human resources or plan to be in human resource. It's a quick, short um, user guide of definition and terms. It's very practical. Um, you do not need this for the course so that you are not required to buy it at all. I'm simply just putting it out there. If you are interested, it's available. So one of the things I want you to share in your written assignment um, for this first assignment is what are you hoping to get out of this class? I'd love to hear from you in a short paragraph, you know, what are you hoping? Some of you, it's just, I need these extra credits to graduate, or I'm actually kind of interested in a human resource benefits job, um, and I'd like to learn more about, about this area of work, or I'm currently in HR and I haven't really been involved in benefits, but I'm looking for pro career progression. I'd love to learn more. So whatever it is that is motivating you, um, and it could just be practical too, I just need these credits to complete my master's um, program. So just let me know in your written assignment, um, a couple pieces, a um, couple sentences rather around what are you hoping to get out of this class? So our focus for this class, these are the things, employee benefits are very vast and wide. And there are lots of new things to think about when we think about employee benefits. 
Um, but in terms of this class, we're going to focus on health benefits, which we're going to deem as medical, dental, and vision. So the, these are things like when you have health insurance offered to you by your employer, this is a medical plan. If you have dental insurance, it's dental benefits or optical benefits, it's vision benefits. We're also going to talk about income protection benefits, which is things like group life and accidental death and dismemberment. That's what ADD stands for, accidental death and dismemberment. We're also gonna talk about short-term disability um, and group long-term disability. We will briefly touch on some compulsory benefits that happen here in the United States. One is Medicare. We're gonna talk about Medicaid and we're gonna talk a little bit about social security. So our main focus is gonna be on health benefits and income protection. We will cover the compulsory items, um, but we will do more of a general overview of those things and go that deep. What we actually won't be covering, um, and I skipped over this note at the bottom, is we're not gonna really be covered divine, defined contribution or defined benefit retirement programs for purposes of this course. We're not gonna have enough time to get into that, but if you have any personal questions or if you are involved in these things and you're trying to think through some decision-making points, um, you can certainly reach out to me one-on-one um, -on -one and we can have a discussion, but we won't formally discuss them in detail during the nine classes we have together here. So why purchase benefits as a group versus individual? So one of the things that when Barack Obama passed healthcare reform or Obamacare, a lot of people were worried that by having healthcare reform and public options available through exchanges, that employers would move away from offering employee benefits. And so the question of why have, why offer group benefits, which is what an employer sponsored program is co considered, it's called the group program. Why offer group insurance over individual? Um, and so just to back that up, when we went live with Obamacare healthcare reform, we actually didn't see any retraction in employee benefits. Um, groups and employers continued to offer employee benefits because of some of these reasons we're going to talk through today, but also it just makes good business sense, which hopefully by the end of this course, um, you'll reach that conclusion as well. So with individual plans, you know, with an individual, you have one person um, kind of influencing the purchasing power, right? It's just like if you were to go and, you know, buy something for yourself, it's going to be, you know, X dollars. Um, you have very little influence over the marketplace. One person in particular isn't going to have the ability to negotiate or curate the best possible options. When you have group coverage, you have large purchasing power. You have many people that are able to influence the program. So let's just think of this in the context of health insurance. So let's just say that one person is spending about $10,000 a year on health insurance um, and th that's the, the kind of the universe of their influence is that $10,000 in premium. Now take that $10,000 in spend and multiply that by 50 employees. Now all of a sudden that volume is about a half a million dollars and your influence and span is significantly larger, right? The insurance company is more likely to listen to the person that's spending a half a million dollars versus the, the person that's spending $10,000. So it's large purchasing power, there's more influence. Generally speaking, the price per person is significantly lower in group programs, but also the benefits tend to be richer because they have an opportunity to kind of bespoke them or customize the benefits because they have a larger span of influence, if that makes sense. So rules for establishing groups, you can't just form a group. You, you have to have kind of rules around that. So you must be a true group. You just can't be, you know, people in your neighborhood band together and say, you know, we're going to formulate, you know, ABC Street Incorporated and everyone on that street is now going to buy benefits. Um, it, that's not a true group. So an employer is a true group, a group of employees working for an employer under a common 
um, agreement and terms and conditions. The other, the other rule is evergreen population. So one of the things that's very attractive in the insurance market is this concept of evergreen. And what that means is just like any place, you have people who are leaving and coming. So you have, you know, terminations and new joiners. You have people who move on to new aspects or new careers, a new company, and then you hire new people or you're growing. So you're hiring. So you have a constant influx of different people joining your program. That's what's considered evergreen populations. You don't have a group of stagnant retirees that are going to be there and aging with you for the next 30 years, um, you have an evergreen population. People are joining the organization, people are leaving the organization, and it's constantly changing, which is very attractive to the insurance industry. You have established eligibility criteria. So meaning you can't just have general open forum, no rules of joining the benefits, but it has to be established eligibility. For example, Anyone working 30 hours a week uh, is eligible for benefits, um, something as simple like that. So it's got to be um, you know, somewhat organized, established eligibility criteria. Um, and it goes beyond just like you know, the employees that also think of it as eligibility criteria for dependents, whether it's spouses, partners, or children, what that looks like. Um, can you have same-sex? partners on the program? What is the criteria? Do they have to be domestic partners? Do they have to show proof? Like what is your criteria for establishing eligibility in that context as well? And then you also have to have centralized administration. What I mean by that is back in my example where we established the group for a half a million dollars, the insurance company isn't going to going to bill each individual person for their 10k or 9k or whatever it is the premium is going to cost. They're going to send that bill to one centralized administrator, your employer, and your employer is going to verify and pay that invoice for everyone. Um, and so that's centralized administration. So when you when you terminate from your employer, they're also going to terminate you from insurance. So you don't have a hundred different people having administrative rights and access to the benefits. It all is being centralized and managed by one unit, which is usually human resources or operations or something like that. And so these are some basic rules for establishing groups um, you know, in terms of employee benefits. So there's a couple of types of coverage within the United States. Um, and we've already touched a little bit on group insurance, but for this purposes of this class, we'll call group insurance employer-sponsored health insurance. So this is insurance that is sponsored by your employer. You may contribute, you may not contribute, but it's group insurance offered through your employer. Another type of insurance here in the United States is Medicaid. Medicaid is government-sponsored health insurance for underprivileged, disadvantaged, and or low-income uh, citizens. This is state governed and federally funded. So each state will define the own criteria that they have to be eligible for Medicaid. So that means if you live in Rhode Island, you might qualify for Medicaid, but if you were to move to Connecticut or Massachusetts or New York, you may not qualify because it is state specific. The federal government helps fund some of this and we'll get into this in the later classes, um, but it is state specific. Medicare, which is government-sponsored health insurance for elderly, and this is federally controlled and funded. So this is all controlled by the federal government, Medicare is, and I'm sure you're not, um, this isn't breaking news, but you've heard, you know, there's always political turmoil about Medicare and the funding, and it's going to, you know, scare senior citizens that they're not, you know, Medicare is going to be underfunded and it's going to collapse or that's all because it's governed at the federal level. And of course, it is used in political stories, you know, across the country, but it is federally funded and it is designed for the elderly population. Again, we'll go into greater detail in later classes. We also have something called individual coverage. And this is mostly um, really come to the forefront with 
health care reform and Obamacare, where it's an open marketplace of insurance for individuals to purchase insurance. Um, that any insurance that's, that's purchased has to be ACA compliant, which is the Affordability Care Act, which is Obamacare or health care reform. That means it has to meet minimum essential benefits coverage, and it has to meet specific criteria outlined by the federal government. Military coverage, so this is covered, sponsored through US military, paid by the federal government. And then lastly, we have uninsured, which is groups of people across the country in every state with no access to coverage. They don't qualify for any of these other components or they haven't taken the, the time to qualify um, and they are just left uninsured with no coverage. In fact, this was the main focus of healthcare reform, trying to address this population and trying to get them insured wherever possible, um, most likely through Medicaid and the Medicaid expansion that came with Obamacare. So these are the types of coverages within the United States that we have for health insurance. Um, the current landscape of health insurance, um, let's look at this when it comes to, I just called Rhode Island out because we're in Rhode Island. So it'll be Rhode Island versus the United States and total. So let's first start with the first one we talked about, which is U.S. group insurance. So this is employer sponsored. So in this case, Rhode Island is 52% of the Rhode Island population is covered under group insurance with the US is about 49%. For Medicaid, we have 23% of Rhode Island citizens are covered under Medicaid. The national average is 20%. Again, remember I said Medicaid is state specific. So actually Rhode Island has a pretty aggressive threshold to qualify for Medicaid. And so it's not surprising that you would see Rhode Island outpacing the national average at 3%. Many of the, the kind of New England states and the coast states, either on the East Coast or West Coast, tend to be um, slightly higher than the national average. Um, and so then we have Medicare. Medicare is about right. It's, it's following suit with the federal government, which again is what you would expect to see. 14% of Rhode Island is covered under Medicare. 14% of the US population is covered under Medicare. And individual coverage, 5% of Rhode Island citizens are under individual policies and 6% are covered under the national average for individual coverage. And then we have a 1% enrollment in military coverage for Rhode Island and um, the national average. And then the uninsured population, this is where Rhode Island is doing an exceptional job, 4% of the population is uninsured, which the national average is 9%. And so you can almost see where it's coming from. We have Medicaid three points higher, and then we have group insurance, you know, three points higher. So when that kind of weighting gets in there, you can see we're driving down um, about 5% of the uninsured population, which is really good, actually, because when you have an uninsured population, it creates pressure on your healthcare system, which we'll get into in a little bit. So I think this is interesting to look at and particularly interesting to see how Rhode Island is comparing to the national average. Let's spend some time talking about the evolution of group benefits in the United States. We have a healthcare system and here that many people complain about and are unhappy with, whether and mostly because of the cost of health insurance. Um, people generally are unhappy, um, but it's re still relatively new and continuing to evolve. So people, um, you know, have this system where they think, or this belief system that they think this health insurance has been around for so long and it really hasn't formed in the way that it, it, it is today until really recently. Um, and we haven't really had many tweaks and changes to it along the way. Um, so let me tell you the story of the evolution of group benefits here in the U.S. So when we think about the early 20th century, century 
the cost of healthcare was generally low. So people weren't worried when there was ailments in their family that they would lose their home because of um, the cost of medicine or healthcare. Most care actually was provided in the home. And so it was a pretty low cost. The bigger concern was when someone fell ill, particularly if it was the breadwinner in your house, how are they going to replace their income? So that was their number one concern is more around wage replacement and what was going to happen to my income if I could not go to work due to an illness. Then between 1910 and 1919, there's no real professional interest in healthcare and demand still is low from an organized insurance perspective. And also what's missing is there's no data for actuaries to, to um, you know, and underwriters to leverage to determine, you know, what should be the risk tolerance for something like that. For those that don't know, an actuary is someone who measures the risk and likelihood of events um, and helps with pricing and predictability of costs in the future um, at insurance companies. And so at this point in time, there's really no data. No one's collecting or organizing this information, and there's really no way to even see if this is an insurable event, healthcare. Um, is an insurable event. And there's no, like I said, no organized mechanism that's tracking the cost of different healthcare items. And it really isn't a hot button and no one is really interested in doing anything with it. And when I say no one, I mean, employers really aren't concerned. It's not creating challenges for them to hire people. Um, the US government's not really concerned. People generally aren't concerned. Politicians aren't hearing it from their constituents. So it's just, and insurance companies aren't really interested in a new product line. So there, there's really no interest there either. Between 1920 and 1927, Europe is starting to fortify their social healthcare system. And some early US politicians begin to create proposals for the US to follow suit, to have some type of social um, system in place. But um, all those proposals are defeated for really lack of interest. No one is really saying it's a hot item and it's not something they want to invest energy in or cost. And so it really goes unaddressed. Meanwhile, in Europe, we're starting to see the formulation of socialized healthcare as we see it um, today in some of those European geographies. 1927, data is starting to get tracked. The creation of Committee on Cost of Medical Care, American Life, is starting to change. So here we have this decision that was made to create this committee to, to track the cost of medical care. It's beginning to spike some interest because people are starting to realize that healthcare is starting to evolve quite quickly. America, American life is starting to change. People are moving away from rural settings and moving towards urban settings where their homes are smaller. They can't care for all of their family members in one home when they're sick. They maybe have to contemplate hospitals and facilities and formal practitioners. The healthcare industry is starting to emerge and grow. More people are beginning to get degrees um, and become doctors and nurses and the healthcare sophistication is starting to leapfrog here in the United States, which is causing cost issues, which is why the government creates the Committee on Cost of Medical Care. Start tracking what the cost of certain procedures are. Then in 1929 and 1939, there's economic pressure, which is continuing to build. It is very hard for organizations to, or for people to um, just live. You know, we have the Great Depression era, we have a challenge with workforces, and there's been a real big call to action to help address costs and drive costs down. As a result um, of the growth from 1927 up till, you know, kind of the mid 30s, a lot of um, hospitals were built and facilities were built because American life was starting to change. However, with the Great Depression, there was a real lack of ability to generate enough revenue. And a lot of these hospitals and physician groups were really struggling to keep the lights on. 
And so what we saw happen first in 1929, a group of hospitals band together to create what we now know as Blue Cross. And those hospitals basically sold prepaid access to their facilities, whether you used it or not. And the goal there was to create a revenue stream to help them keep their lights on and keep their organizations operational and running. After that happened, a group of physicians saw the success of Blue Cross and they formed Blue Shield with the same concept in 1939, creating a group of physicians on a common network where you could prepay for access to general and specialist practitioners, and it would help um, give them cash flow to maintain their operation, but also help families have more affordable visits to doctors and hospitals because they were prepaid memberships. In 1942, labor is in high demand and we're creating a race to higher wages. What's happening here is companies are, the economy is beginning to rebound and boom and we don't have enough people to work at all of these organizations. The companies begin to um, attract competitor talent from each other, driving up inflation and driving up the cost of labor. Um, you can go and recruit an employee and pay them 20% more, and then everyone would try to get that employee for 20% 20 20 even more higher. And so it created this real big challenge of stabilizing the economy, and we had labor shortages, inflation was at an all-time high, and everything was kind of spiraling out of control. The government passed the stabilization. Stabilization Act of 1942. And this is an essential act for employee benefits because this established that you could not go and push all these high, high um, salary offers, but what you could do is you could offer robust employee benefits tax-free. So in essence, instead of paying someone $40,000, you would potentially pay them 35, so lowering your cash outlay, but then invest 5K into a benefits package tax-free. So it created an incentive for you as an employer to offer benefits and get some tax incentives. And so the Stabilization Act of 1942 passes and really creates this private benefits marketplace that we are used to today. Then moving forward, um, and actually what's kind of interesting is at, in 1942, like before we get to this point, um, at this point really only Blue Cross and Blue Shield were offering some type of group benefits. We had our first group benefit when you think about an employer employee relationship sold to a group of teachers in texas actually and um that kind of began the concept of group benefits leveraging the stabilization um, act and we saw interest from other insurance companies now starting to emerge so it began with the tracking of data in 1927 then the formulation of Blue Cross and Blue Shield in 29 and 39, and then the Stabilization Act of 1942 kind of is the frosting on the cake saying, okay, you could actually make money if you offer some type of group benefits. And they're talking to, at the time, there were many health insurance carriers across the country. Now we have a handful of national carriers, um, United Healthcare, Aetna or CVS, um, Cigna Healthcare, and of course, we have our different Blue Cross Blue Shield relationships. Um, and so they really emerge the market and say, you know, we're interested in, in creating products and benefits for group benefits. Then in 1965 to present, there really hasn't been much change. In 1965, Medicare and Medicaid was added. Um, what they felt like the group benefits for active employees from 1942 on was serving the purpose of providing benefits for those of us that were actively at work. But what it wasn't doing is it wasn't solving for the elderly who were no longer working and the underprivileged staff that maybe couldn't, or citizens rather, that could not work. Maybe they were 
disabled, maybe they were under-resourced in other, some other way. And so Medicare and Medicaid was designed to address kind of those underserved populations, assuming that actively at work people were getting their benefits now, their health care from their employer for the most part. Um, and so that passes in 65. And then as I referenced earlier in 2010, the ACA the Affordability Care Act, Obamacare, health care reform, whatever you're calling it, was signed into law. And that was really the, the last change we've seen in an organized way for health insurance. I will also just note that health insurance is generally governed at the state level, um, except for a couple of things. So Medicare, as I talked about the elderly, that is governed at the, the federal level. And then self-insured clients, um, self-insured programs are governed at the federal level. And then, of course, ACA is also has is the federal law, which was why it was such a big deal, because up until that point, health insurance is really regulated at the state level. So each state could make their own determination. And, you know, if you recall, there was a lot of political turmoil when Obamacare was passed. And a lot of it had to do with the, the feeling that the federal government was overstepping their role into the state's affairs because it was enforcing minimum benefits, essential benefits, things like that from a federal perspective down to the state level. And so it was quite controversial and continues to be controversial um, for different aspects. So that is the evolution. Um, and it really hasn't been that long if you think about the first group benefit really being established in the 40s um, to now, um, it really hasn't been that long. Um, and so we still have, you know, parts of our story yet to unfold and, and continue to evolve as we, you know, change the product offering um, in the future. So why do employers offer employee benefits? There's lots of reasons. Um, some of the most common reasons include attract and retain top talent. I'm sure one of the things you think about as you make job selections are what are my, my benefits going to look like? And when we think about benefits, we're thinking about, of course, our salary, but also what is my health care, my dental, what is my disability, my life insurance? Um, do I have a retirement program? Do I have any other perks or things like that? that really can make a big difference. You know, if two things are created equal, two job opportunities are created equal, but one has better benefits, you're more likely to be attracted to the job that has better benefits, all other things being equal. Um, it increases and improves productivity. So it's just a known fact that when people feel distracted with personal challenges outside of work, and it could be like, you know, my family has this medical ailment that I don't know how I'm going to pay for. Um, but it's one less thing you have to worry about if you know your health insurance that is, it is good, it's comprehensive, and it's offered to your employer is going to take care of that. You are less likely to, you know, take work hours to worry and stress about those things that um, you know are covered under your program. Um, and you feel less distracted in general, so you can be more productive in your um, you know, daily functions at your work. Um, there's favorable tax legislation. So if those other two reasons aren't enough for the employer, there are tax incentives for that employer to go ahead and offer group benefits. Um, there's efficiency of group benefits, just like we talked at the beginning of today's lecture. It's just better. The point and scale pricing is usually better for groups. It's lower pricing. It's better administrations. It's more efficient, not just from a fiscal perspective, but an administrative perspective as well. And economic trends and pressures. So group benefits can help um, relieve some of those economic pressures and trends that are happening. Um, we can have more um, line of sight to those things using our group strategies. And so there's lots of other reasons, but these are some of the most common ones, probably the biggest one being attracting and retaining talent. And then, of course, the favorable tax legislation, because employers really do care about those financial incentives that come with offering benefits to their staff. And it's much cheaper for them to do that than to add um, more money to their salary, because that comes with other tax liabilities and payroll tax applicable benefits 
benefits um, like workers' comp and things like that. As you escalate someone's income, those other non-returnable components add to your cost, where benefits, um, while they add to your cost, they actually are helping you attract and retain talent, which is ultimately helping you produce better um, outcomes, products, services, whatever it is that you are, are working on as, an, as the employer. So another hot item came up during um, this past year in 2023, um, or actually 2022, when Roe v. Wade was overturned. And, you know, we had a moment where we needed to think about how does Roe v. Wade impact group benefits? So for those that are unfamiliar, of course, um, we know that abortion was um, not illegal and that insurance companies and employers, because it was at the state level, could drive benefit decisions. And now with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that really opens up this interpretation to be more aggressive, um, you know, and may not align with your personal mission. And so, employers have had to think about what role they want to play in this Roe v. Wade debate when it comes to employee benefits. And do we want our employees to have access to what we would consider um, basic human benefits? Um, and so that's a, that's, that's a conversation that you have to have as an employer to think about, you know, what you... Um, Want. And it also is a strong statement. When we think about this last thing about attracting and retaining top talent that I mentioned, you know, if you're an organization that has staff that really believe in their right to choose, um, and then you are putting a stake in the ground where you're saying, yes, philosophically, we believe this too, and we're going to offer certain benefits that make that accessible to our staff. Um, um, it could really go a long way in attracting and retaining the employees you would like to be part of the fabric of your organization. So I pose this question, you don't have to formally respond to it, but um, it's something to think about. And it's interesting how like, you know, political pressures and, and, and trends that happen in our country, how they impact employee benefits. This is a pretty obvious one, but there are things that happen all the time um, that could impact our employee benefit strategy. So we're, it's really important to stay up to current events and trends so you can think through, you know, what's on the minds of, it, of your potential employee population out in the community so you can address them with, you know, benefits that really speak to them. So what is, in, what is included in the benefits package? So yeah, each circle is gonna represent the size in terms of financial investment from an employer, the biggest, this is excluding salary, of course. The biggest is medical benefits. Healthcare medical benefits cost a lot of money. The second is dental, um, and the third is vision. Then we have our income protection benefits, which are things like life, accidental death and dismemberment, short-term disability, and long-term disability. And then we have a host of other benefits, which could be really all over the place. They could be voluntary, so think about Voluntary benefits as like um, maybe pet insurance or AFLAC um, type of coverage, like hospital indemnity or uh, catastrophic illnesses. There could be educational benefits like tuition reimbursement, which many of you are probably participating in. Um, you know, even compulsory benefits like you know Social Security. There's taxation and contributions from from you and the employer that go into that. PTO is considered a benefit, retirement, other perks, maybe a cell phone allowance or something like that. These are all pieces that kind of factor into that package. Um, usually makes up 30 to 35 percent of the total employee costs and the 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 rest of it is salary, right? So whether it's 70 or 65 percent is salary and then 30 to 35 percent of that is usually employee um, you know, employee costs. So questions to consider when developing a benefit strategy. What benefits will help me attract and retain talent? You know, what is our target employee demographic and what benefits do they find valuable? So you really have to take a step back and see, you know, where does your organization live in the marketplace? What are the 
you know, what are the types of things they're focused on? And then who do you think is a target potential employee and what do they find valuable? Those are the things you need to think about when you're curating a benefit package that really is unique and specific to your target market from an employee perspective. What benefits should we offer? So you need to then take that information and create a business case because this is a big investment. We just saw 30 to 35% of the costs are benefits. And so you can multiply that quickly and realize this is a significant investment. And so we are going to have to create a business case for why we want to offer certain things. Um, you know, if you know that your population, you know, loves their pets and you want to offer pet insurance, you really need to make a strong business case for why pet insurance is an essential part of your benefit strategy. And you need to tie that into your demography, um, meaning the type of employees that are working there. Who should be covered under the plan? So you have to define that eligibility. So a step further is to say, okay, all employees working a minimum of 20 hours, 25 hours, 30 hours, whatever it is, um, are gonna be eligible. We're gonna cover spouses. This is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna cover, you know, uh, partners and you know domestic partners and same-sex partners and what whatever it is you have to define that eligibility how should we pay for the benefits so this is where you have to think about how are we going to fund it there's a couple different funding strategies which we'll get to later in the course and how, do we want our employees to share in the cost most employers split or have some portion of the cost covered by the employee um, and it could be 20%, it could be 30%. Some employers cover the full cost at 100%. So you have to think about what you want that to look like. And then lastly, you do all this work. And so it's really, this is often a piece that's missed and people do not do this job, this part of the job really well, is employee communication. How will we communicate the benefits to the staff, not just we offer health insurance and you have a PPO and your deductible is this, but why did we select this health insurance? Why do we have these benefits? Why do we believe they're best for you as an employee here? And how proud we are to offer this and have put this thought into these benefits, making that employee really feel valuable and that you know they're being seen as an individual and as a contributor to your overall goal in this communication is really, really important. And you know, how much do you share? You know, you may not want to share everything with your employees. It may be too much information, but you know, you want to balance that. Um, and you know, how involved are they in that decision? We've worked with employers who really their employees, you know, are on the younger end and they really aren't that engaged with healthcare. And so we're very mindful about, you know, the level of communication we're sharing. So you have to tailor it to your audience and know who you're speaking to, but take this opportunity to cure, curate a communication plan that actually makes sense. So who are the stakeholders within an employer's benefits package? Um, you know, there's a couple stakeholders and it is not limited to the ones I'm gonna walk us through. So one of course is the employer. Um, they are the ones who curate the benefits, are that central repository for administration and they're managing it and they're, they're paying for it. Um, they're doing all of the onboarding and all of that work, it's a lot. So they're a stakeholder. The second is the employee. You as the employee are a stakeholder. You are using the benefits. You are making a decision to work at this company based on the benefits package. It's a, a really critical piece. Um, and so you are also a stakeholder. Dependents, your children, your spouse, your partner, whomever, they are also stakeholders. How you cover insurance and you, if you're going to cover your dependents is going to impact them. And so it's important, you know, you share the, the benefits package with the other stakeholders, your dependents, your domestic partner, your children, whatever. Um, so you make those decisions with them in mind because they are benefit stakeholders. Um, managers, oftentimes this gets overlooked. Managers aren't usually involved in the day-to-day -day decisions of what to offer for employee benefits, but they often are the first line of defense. They're the first person asked like, oh, I need more information about this. Can you tell me more? And generally speaking, the manager doesn't usually know that much um, more than you. And so, you know, this is an opportunity as a human resource and a benefits professional to engage managers separately and arm them with the right information. They are a key stakeholder. They are the ones 
that are most worried about keeping you, attracting you, and or retaining talent. So why would they not be an essential stakeholder where you're communicating and informing them and telling them all the attributes and assets to why we selected this benefits package for them to retain and retract their talent. Um, finance, of course, they pay the invoice, they're responsible for the cost and the effectiveness and that return on the investment. So they really need to be engaged in the financial outlay and why it's worth um, the investment and what has it done to help attract you know, the top talent, decreased turnover, you know, whatever it is, finance is a huge stakeholder here. Human resources, ultimately, they are involved in a lot of the tactical stuff and helping you troubleshoot your, you know, lost ID card or your denied claim or whatever. It's really essential. Um, they're an essential part of the benefits relationship. Vendors, your insurance company, um, as an example, is a stakeholder. They, they, ultimately are executing the benefits package and they want it to go well. If they do a bad job communicating it or they have, you know, mismatched benefits and customer service isn't great, it's going to turn into more work. They're likely to lose the account in that way, impacting their investment to enroll this program. So they have a vested interest to make sure that the benefits um, are going over well, that people are feeling supported. And so they are a key stakeholder here as well. And then in the end, the, the overall, you know, your customers, um, because if you have distracted employees and you have high turnover and you have, um, you know, your cost, your return on investment is too high and you are not able to add other resources in other ways because your, your customers will be impacted. Um, if you have distracted workers, the product's not as good. And so ultimately your customers are also a key stakeholder. Um, obviously they're not part of this decision-making tree, but in the end they are impacted by poor performers or poor product development or whatever, because maybe there were distractions. And so um, these are just some of the stakeholders. Of course, this is not a comprehensive list, um, some of the main stakeholders. So our journey through the benefits package um, through this course is we're gonna look at a bunch of things. Um, we're gonna actually start here uh, today and go through our medical benefits. Um, so let's jump to it. So when we think about medical benefits, um, we have a couple different products. So this chart that we're looking at, we have um, high cost. I'm gonna just pull my note here. Uh, here. So high cost here, low cost network and non-network. So when you think about network, think about a group of doctors who are contracted with the insurance company and that's who you can go to for benefits. So an HMO has the most strict network, meaning you can only see in-network doctors and as a result, they control costs really well and it's a very low cost plan. Then we have the point of service, which allows for an out-of-network benefit, which is why it's a little bit further down the network bar. It's a little bit more expensive because it is allowing out-of-network access. And then we have our PPO, which is probably, I should also say the size of the, the, the object also indicates the number of percentage of population. So we have our most people across the United States enrolled in a PPO, which stands for a Preferred Provider Organization. And this allows for an in-network benefit and an out-of-network, which is why it's kind of smack dab over here. Um, and, and it can be both low cost and it can be both high cost, depending on how you define the benefits. But it's our broadest product here in the United States. It offers a very significant in-network relationship, but then also offers a very significant out-of-network benefit as well. And then we have indemnity, which is no network, which is basically like you can go, it's the polar opposite of HMO. You can go anywhere you want and the benefits are going to be what they're going to be. They're very high cost, but there is no network. This only really makes sense in certain rural parts of the United States where there really isn't a um, a heightened amount of providers. There's very few providers and those providers that do exist are not contracting 
with health insurance companies. And so a PPO and out allowing them to always go out of network would be too cost prohibitive. And so they would produce a indemnity style insurance product for those types of people. Um, and so very few people are enrolled. So the most Americans are enrolled in a PPO followed by an HMO. And most of the HMO enrollment is on the West Coast of the United States. Our, our third most is the point of service. I think it's around 8% of the US population. This is about 50%. And then this is um, about 1%, um, I believe, of the population. So let's walk through an HMO just to kind of further explain what it looks like. <clears throat> this is an HMO plan. So as I described, there is a gatekeeper. It can be optional gatekeeper. In, it means that you have to seek care first from that, that a general practitioner who then refers you to different care. They're the gatekeeper of your care. And then they refer you and then you can go access care. But this nowadays is mostly optional. So it's, they're mostly open HMOs, which open access HMOs, which allows you to really go to any provider within the HMO. So you have routine care covered at 100%. You usually have, this is just an example, so all HMOs are, are created a little bit different, but in network, you would have a copay for a primary care. That's what PCP stands for. SPC stands for specialist care. It's usually a separate copay. It's usually not the same as primary, but it can be. There's usually some type of copay for an emergency room visit. You can go to any emergency room that you'd like and you would pay this copay and then the, the rest would be covered um, you know, at 100%. You also have an individual deductible in some cases through an HMO and a, and a family deductible. This means that you know, any one individual is 500, but at the family level, the family deductible would be $1,000. You can have this built a couple different ways. Um, you can also have coinsurance and then an out-of-pocket maximum for individual and for family. And what's interesting here is once you hit this out-of-pocket maximum, benefits, allowable benefits would be covered at 100%. So if you had a really terrible year um, of sicknesses and you as an individual incurred $1,500 out of pocket, which includes this deductible, by the way, so this is an attribute of healthcare reform. Under healthcare reform, any one of these things you're paying money more for, whether it's this copay or this ER copay or this deductible, all accumulate towards this out of pocket maximum. And once you hit, it is a true out-of-pocket maximum. Once you hit this out-of-pocket maximum, your benefits cover 100%. And then you have your pharmacy benefits, um, $10 for generic, 20 for brand, and 50 for formulary. So it's just what it says, is generic are generic um, prescriptions. You're probably most familiar with that. Brand or brand name prescriptions. Formulary are brands that are on a separate list by your health insurance carrier. This can dis change based on health insurance carrier. Now, the big thing to notice here with an HMO is that there is no coverage out of network. There is one exception to that, and it is here with emergency room. You can access an emergency room out of network, and it will still be the $250 copay, even in an HMO because it is an emergency and it does have to be an emergency. So you can't access the emergency room for a routine visit and think that's gonna be covered, that will not be covered. But if it was a true emergency, which is just a layman's term of an emergency, you know, high fever, a broken leg, it doesn't have to be life or death, um, but it has to be urgent and emergent, it would be covered at the same, even out of network, but just for that emergency room visit. So that's the main thing with an HMO is there is no out of network. All the care has to be in network. Then when we say point of service or PPO, what, what you'll notice now is we've added this, another, this other care, this out of network. And this is the same for PPOs and POSs, points of service. Um, they're different types of products in the sense that the POS is, is built from an HMO and then it adds an out of network benefit. And the PPO is really built from an indemnity and then adds an in-network benefit. And so in, on paper, they look the same, but the cost functions are a little bit different in terms of what, how much insurance companies charge for them. 
but you'll see the same kinds of things here. So you'll see a primary care, let's walk through like two examples. So if you were to have a primary care copay under a PPO, maybe it's $25 as long as you go in network. If you go out of network, you would contribute 30%. So the plan will cover 70 and your contribution would be 30% out of network, okay? Another example would be your out-of-pocket maximum. So your out-of-pocket maximum is in network is 1,500. Again, everything accumulates to that out-of-pocket maximum, and that is thanks to the ACA or Obamacare or healthcare reform. They all accumulate to 1,500. Under out-of-network, that's the same. They do all accumulate, but they have to hit a higher amount, so 40. 500 in this example. This is just an example. Once you hit these out-of-pocket maximums, it is true that you're as long as it's an allowable benefit, it will be covered at 100%. The difference is in network, it will be 100% period. There is no other caveat. Out of network, it would be 100% of what's allowable, okay? And the allowable reimbursement rates are not always very rarely actually are they ever 100% of the true cost. So there are some loopholes and fine print here out of network to really be conscious of. Thankfully, uh, in the, across the United States, only about 5% of care is executed out of any particular network. So it's a very small threshold, but it is enough of a pain point, point when it does happen that employees really do need to understand what that looks like. Let's look at an indemnity plan. Indemnity plan is just what it, what it sounds like. There's no network. You can just kind of go wherever you want to go and you have set co-pays you have to pay and a deductible. And this is what really what the forced form um, group benefits really look like before those products were designed. Um, and this is just how it works. You just go and you know they would pay the bill. Now it's how it is today with, with indemnity, but you see this asterisk note, it's typically tied to usual and customary charges or a Medicare reimbursement rate. That's what I just described as the out of network on the PPO is the same way. So when this says, you know, it covers 25, let's walk through an example. If the, you went to a doctor's office and that doctor in this rural part of the country through this indemnity plan charged $500 for your routine doctor visit, but the usual and customary rate is 200, your plan, you would pay $25 and then anything above the $200, which is considered reasonable customary, which in my example would, three, would be 300, you would be expected to pay. So you would actually pay $325 for that visit. So it's very misleading on paper. Um, and it can be very confusing to employees, of course, that are impacted by that kind of usual and customary caveat. Um, so as an employer, it's really important to educate our staff so that they're not getting caught off guard. Because on paper, this looks great, right? You'd say, well, this looks simpler than everything. What I just would have that. If I can afford it, I should go here. But there are, you know, there are caveats here that actually create some challenges for employees. So what medical products do you have? So take a moment and just think to yourself, um, you know, if you're covered by yourself or through the school or through a parent, do you have an HMO, a PPO, a point of service, or it's unlikely that you will have an indemnity, but do you have an indemnity? And, um, you know, just think about that and see what your experience tells you. Then we have this concept, and this is the kind of tail end of what we're going to talk about for today's class which is consumerism. So consumerism really, consumerism really emerged in the early 2000s because the cost of healthcare um, really started to escalate aggressively, like 30, 40, 50% a year, mostly due to like escalations and uh, advancements of technology and the cost of certain treatments and um, the direct consumer marketing that we all see now as a normal thing. Um, back then it wasn't happening, meaning like you're watching TV and you see five different pharmaceutical commercials, like that used to not happen. That really started happening in the early 2000s and um, really escalating the cost because people would then call and ask for these boutique prescriptions and um, you know, consumerism was a way to create a couple things. One is bring a, a, the consumer 
into the process, engage them. Before, before consumerism, there was no true understanding of what the costs were. Um, em employees just kind of assumed it was all covered and didn't really understand the cost of a doctor's visit or something like that. And the concept of consumerism was meant to, you know, bring employees into the total cost view so they could A, make more informed decisions, but also B, potentially, um, you know, make better decisions that led to lower costs. Um, and then C, you know, really shed light on what the employer is actually doing on behalf of them. Um, it created price transparency. So as an engaged consumer, what do you want to do? You want to co compare prices and say, oh, I can get this x-ray at the hospital for, you know, $1,000, or I can go to this clinic and pay 500 and it's the same machine. So why wouldn't I go here? And if you're paying the money out of your pocket, you're more likely to go to the $500 option. So price transparency was a huge part of consumerism. And then creating consumer products. So how, okay, so this is great, but like, how are we getting those employees um, engaged in the process? And so really um, we introduced the concept of high deductible health plans. Um, and this was before Obamacare or healthcare reform. So with these products, there was 100% wellness was covered. There was no deductible. All other care though was subject to deductible, pretty high deductible, thousand plus dollars per person. Um, after the deductible is met, the underlying benefits would then apply. So for example, if you had a primary care copay of $25, you would first have to meet your $1,000 deductible for non-routine care, and then that copay would kick in. This would include pharmacy copays. So if you needed like life-saving chronic illness prescriptions, you would have to meet your deductible first and then your pharmacy copays would apply. So this, looking at this, you would say, okay, well, there's a $500 deductible, that's high. There's a family deductible of 1,000. I might think this is a high deductible. However, this plan as it exists is actually not a high deductible health plan or HDH plea, high deductible health plan. This is. And so notice the red additions where you have, before we had, PCP copay of $25, but here we have the PCP decoder $25 after the deductible, the specialist copay of $50 after the deductible, the pharmacy copays after the deductible, and we have a significantly higher deductible. So of course, this is gonna be lower premium cost, but it's gonna increase the out-of-pocket cost for employees. And so we needed a product that then went away along with this to help employees save and afford those higher deductibles. And so that was the birth of health reimbursement accounts or HRAs, and then HSAs, which is health savings accounts. So an HRA is an account set up and funded by your employer to help pay for eligible healthcare expenses. So the employer would give you money to pay for those deductibles. It's the employer's money, it is not your money, but they make it accessible in a notional bank account, which allows you to pay for deductibles. For an HSA, it's actually a savings account, which is compatible with a high, it has to be only offered with a high deductible plan. An HSA can only be offered if you have a true qualified HDHP, while an HRA, you do not need to have an HDHP. Um, and it has to be established, the HSA has to be established to help pay for those qualified healthcare expenses. So who's eligible? Under an HRA, an employee enrolled in the plan set by the employer is eligible to participate in the HRA. For an HSA, you must be enrolled in a high deductible health plan. Who owns the account? For an HRA, it is your employer. For the HSA, it is you. That money is yours. If you leave your employer, that money in the HSA comes with you, period. They cannot claw it back. It is not there. If you leave your employer and you have an HRA, that money belongs to your employer. It is not yours. You lose and forfeit that money. Who can contribute for an HRA? It is only your employer. You cannot contribute to an HRA. For an HSA, you, your employee, your family, or some other person can contribute towards your HSA on a pre-tax basis. Limit to the dollar amount that can be put in. This HRA, it, since it's your employer, it really depends on your employer rules. You don't, you cannot actually put money in. 
But under an HSA, yes, the IRS will actually limit the internal revenue services, will limit the amount of money based on tax code that you can put into an HSA as an employee. Will the balance carry over into the next plan year? Your employer may or may not allow this for an HRA. That is up to your employer. And yes, the money stays into your account. It's your account and you can use it into retirement. There's no problem. Can I take the account with me? Is it portable? I have already explained this under an HRA. No, that money belongs to your employer. It is not yours. HSA, as soon as that money hits your account, it is yours. You can quit the next day. They cannot take it back. Can the money in the account earn interest? There is no money in an account in an HRA. So the answer is no. It is sitting in a notional account, which is a non-funded account. Under an HSA, yes, it can. It's your money. It's sitting in an account. You can invest that. There are certain criteria set. Um, I believe it's $5,000. Once you have a balance of $5,000, you can invest in different funds and things like that. Um, but you would need to check with your plan. Um, that is subject to change too. But yes, the money is yours and you can invest it and earn interest. Can I use the money for things other than qualified or el eligible healthcare expenses? HRA, no, you cannot do that. Under the HSA, yes, when you reach age 65, when you withdraw the money, it is subject to income tax only. If you are under age 65, the money is subject to income tax and you must pay the 20% penalty tax. But it is your money, like your 401k, you can use that money. Can I use the money to pay for COBRA or other plan premiums? The answer for HR is yes, as long as your employer allows it. Again, it's their money, they set the rules, but if they say yes, then the answer is yes. For an HSA, yes, as allowed by IRS guidelines. Um, and so that is the end of class one and two. I know it was a longer pre-recorded. Hopefully you broke this up and didn't sit there and listen um, for the whole class, but I am, Really excited to kind of go through this semester. I'm going to just go back to the syllabus really fast at the beginning so we can highlight what we're going to talk about in the next class. Um, and we can go from there. Thank you for sticking with me um, during this class. Let's go back here. Okay. So we discussed the group general employee benefits, the formation of groups. We talked about the assignments and I briefly talked through medical plans today. During the next class, which will also be posted on or before July 7th, I will distribute a link. We will talk about the type of risk, the rising cost of healthcare, and we'll go into healthcare reform or PPACA as you wish to call it. The reading assignments are pages 37 to 54, 93 to 106, and that written assignment, which is a two-page summary of a reading, is due July 11th. So just as a reminder, your first written assignment is due June 30th, and it is on your reading page 3 to 35, 57 to 93. Please keep it to two pages. It is just meant to be bulleted summaries of your readings. Um, and again, in your notes, share with me for that first assignment what you're hoping to get out of this class. Um, and if you want to add a note about what product you think you have, as I asked that question as well, about do you have a PPO, an HMO, a point of service, um, you know, please feel free to add that. And if you have any thoughts about how the Roe v. Wade overturning um, decision would impact group benefits, you know, feel free to add that in as well with your first paper. So again, get that first assignment over to me by June 30th. With the holiday and such, if you need more time, please just reach out to me. I'm happy to talk it through. So thanks for sticking with me. I'm looking forward to a great um, semester. And I will release the next pre-recorded session on or before July seventh and I will see you live in person for the first in-person class on July 11th. Thanks again and talk to you all very soon.